Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ed Carr. Uh, I'm the U.S. Center Director at the Stockholm Environment Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar uh, from Gray to Green, Finding Common Cause for People and Planet. Uh, in today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the connection between climate change and biodiversity. This is a theme that all of the Stockholm Environment Institute's centers are taking up in various events. Our particular focus today is on the work that we do in the US Center that navigates some of the challenges that come up whenever you try to work on biodiversity and climate change together. Uh, I'm joined today by three of my colleagues, uh, Laura Forney, Doug Chalmers, and Rob Bayliss. Uh, and I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves as I call them up. Uh, and rather than continue with much more of a preamble, I think we're going to go right into it. So I'm going to ask my colleague Rob Bayliss to start us off. And Rob, you should be able to share your screen and your slides. Do it now. All right, I hope you can see the presentation screen and not the notes screen. Yes. Great. All right, so thanks a lot, Ed. I'm gonna just jump right in. So. Uh, my name is Rob Bayless. I'm a senior scientist with uh, SEI based in uh, the East Coast of the U.S., working out of the Boston or some real office. Um, I do research on uh, household energy in low middle income countries, uh, and that means mainly focusing on uh, wood fuels and the implications of their use. And I will talk about that in the context of climate and biodiversity for the next few minutes before passing off to a colleague. So... So I'll give a little bit of a background. Uh, this is something I'm steeped in, but I know not everybody thinks about this every day. So uh, I'll just go through some of the uh, some of the background information here, talk about the scale of the wood fuel challenge in low, low and middle income countries, and then uh, go into how this relates to uh, climate change, land degradation, and impacts on biodiversity. So uh, globally around the uh, throughout all low and middle income countries, about 2.3 billion people use wood fuels. And this has profound impact on uh, society in many ways. Uh, when I say wood fuels, uh, I mean uh, people using unprocessed firewood, using charcoal, which is you know, carbonized wood, and then to a much lesser extent, people using processed fuels like wood pellets. Um, if you look at the graph on the right, uh, the WHO estimates that uh, today, like I said, roughly 2.3 billion people use them, uh, use a mix of these fuels. And projecting forward through 2050, globally, the amount of people is projected to decrease, uh, but it's projected to increase in sub-Saharan Africa by nearly 450 million people. So that means together, the population of the US and Mexico, more people using wood fuels in, in that region alone. Um, what are the implications? So uh, the WHO tells us that roughly uh, 2.6 million avoidable deaths in low middle countries occurred in 2021. That's the most recent year for which data is available. That's more than malaria, TB, and HIV combined. So this is a really profound impact on public health. The same pollutants that come when you burn wood uh, in small fires in, in indoor settings uh, that harm health also uh, contribute to climate forcing. So we're talking uh, CO2, uh, methane, uh, particulate matter, black carbon, and combined they contribute to about one to 2% of climate forcing uh, on an annual basis. And that's roughly equivalent to the shipping sector to the aviation sector. Uh, so well, it seems like a small number, but uh, you know it's something that uh, it's, it's of the magnitude that in other sectors, the world is scrambling to try and do something to mitigate. Um, it places a very large burden on household labor and budget. Um, and then it's also globally the largest source of demand for woody biomass. Roughly half of the world's wood harvest ends up burned as fuel. And this, you can imagine, uh, in unmanaged settings is a major driver of degradation. Okay, and that's the, the hook here. That's where we're going to link to land use change and to um, its biodiversity impacts. So... For many years, uh, wood fuel consumption was thought to be a major driver of deforestation. Here, note here, I highlighted the word degradation, and I want to draw a distinction here. So um, there was this association between wood fuel consumption and degradation, but by the 1990s or 2000s, evidence emerged challenging that link 
between wood fuels and deforestation, noting that in most cases, deforestation in the sense of permanent human-induced transition from forest to non-forest land cover is in most cases driven by demand for agricultural land, not necessarily by unsustainable wood harvesting. This view is generally accepted by uh, the scientific community. Um, but that old narrative of linking wood fuels and deforestation is surprisingly sticky outside of the scientific community. I really, I won't go into reasons why that might be the case, but suffice it to say, that the relationship between wood fuel consumption and environmental changes is fairly complex and nuanced. So one of the nuances that's, that's particularly relevant for this discussion for our panel is whether we can extend this link between wood fuels and degradation um, toward known consequences of degradation like biodiversity loss. Um, you know, so the, those linkages are known. We generally know that in intact ecosystems are, are good for biodiversity and that ecosystem degradation is bad. So by some transitive property, we think wood fuels lead to degradation, degradation leads to biodiversity loss. And like I said, the, the arrow I have here shows that that's, that's an impact that's, that's fairly well known. Again, degradation, biodiversity loss, also fairly known. Um, so we conclude that in some cases, wood fuels can actually negatively impact biodiversity, but I'm hedging here for a particular reason. And that's because there's very few the very, very little research that actually shows this link explicitly. So I'll talk a little bit about why that might be the case. Um, and I'll highlight one or two examples of, of some solid research that actually does demonstrate that. Um, but just for, for clarity, my research sort of sits at this first nexus between wood fields and degradation. Um, personally, I don't extend into biodiversity loss, but, but I try and track that research and, and that's what I'll, I'll uh, raise in a minute. So first I wanna talk a little bit about the mechanisms here. How, how does this actually play out? So how do wood fuels drive degradation? Um, and just starting very basic, and but also um, acknowledging this is a very carbon focused approach and it glosses over some of the other complexities of land degradation. Um, but we start by thinking that nearly all landscapes can produce a measurable increment of woody biomass. And if wood is harvested beyond that amount, then tree cover declines and we would consider that an unsustainable situation. This leads to carbon emissions from what we would call non-renewable biomass, biomass that's withdrawn beyond the landscape's capacity to regenerate. This also creates opportunities. I'll talk about that in a minute. So this, this um, parameter, this uh, non-renewable biomass or NRB is a, is a simple proxy for wood fuel driven degradation. And it's used to quantify the impact of current practices. So what do people do today and what are the impacts? It's also used to gauge the effectiveness of intervention. So if we intervene in this space, for example, by disseminating more improved stoves or uh, encouraging people to switch away from using wood or charcoal to using other types of fuels, what is the impact? And this is a parameter that, that gives us a sense of that. And it's also used to justify carbon finance investments in the sector, which are important because there's not a lot of money going into the sector. And that's one way to encourage more investment that, uh, that, that could potentially lead to a uh, positive change. All right, so I'll give a real world example of this. This is from, from research that I didn't do, uh, but uh, uh, some uh, people that I know from University of Maryland worked on. Um, and they were looking at forest degradation in Southern Mozambique, uh, driven by charcoal harvesting over a 10 year period between 2008 and 2018. And what you see on the left is an image showing degradation, showing decreased biomass on the landscape, uh, where you're looking at, if you see the blue shades moving into the red shades, you see like a sort of a frontier of degradation moving up from population centers at this small dot here and this small dot here, moving out into uh, the forested landscape. On the right, you can see uh, resolu uh, high resolution images of charcoal kilns, those are in the blue boxes, and uh, how immediately after harvest, NDVI, which is an indication of, I guess, let's say vegetation health, uh, goes down dramatically around those uh, impact sites immediately after the, uh, or in the year after the, the harvesting. So we have a, a, a series of uh, satellite images on the top, and then a time series on the bottom that displays how these, uh, how NDVI was, was impacted. It does eventually recover, but you have a, a lower level of stock and presumably with lower stock, you have lower uh, or affected ecosystem function and, um, and uh, diminished ecosystem services. So if we take 
this one example, and we sort of aggregated across all the instances where people were doing this all throughout the global south, uh, we can try and quantify what is the impact, how much degradation are we talking about. This is from a, a research from another group uh, that tried to quantify all of the forest degradation uh, throughout the um, throughout the tropics in this case. Uh, and you can see, looking across the top, you have total degradation. Uh, and then they tried to dis, uh, disaggregate it by cause. And the takeaway here, there's two. Uh, first, they quantify the, the actual uh, total emissions from wood fuel degradation, from wood fuel driven degradation. Uh, they count it at about uh, 0.6 or 620 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. And they attribute that uh, about 30% of overall degradation can be attributed to wood fuel uh, harvesting. Of course, it's not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous across different regions. Uh, in some cases, it's very minor. If you look to the left, uh, that looks at Latin America, you see that the wood fuel contribution is quite small. However, in East Africa, Northeast Africa, and, and South, South Asia, uh, it's actually the majority of the degradation is driven by this, this uh, factor. Okay. Uh, to talk about some of my own work, uh, I uh, collaborate with some people who uh, have built a, a global model to look at this uh, throughout, uh, well, throughout the global South, really, anywhere where this is, uh, where wood fields are being consumed. And you could see, shading from greens to reds, uh, hotspots in the same areas that were identified by the previous study. And um, this is uh, based on a model we built for uh, doing work for the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on, Tri on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, uh, to inform uh, Article 6 deliberations around uh, activity looking to mitigate this particular source of emissions. Uh, and um, we were able to add up in a similar way, and we find roughly the same, which was quite satisfying, roughly the same amount of emissions that that previous study found, but we found about 0. 0.7 or 700 million tons of, uh, of CO2 per year. Um, this work, by the way, is uh, yet to be published, but it's available online at this link. Anyone who's interested uh, will be happy to share the, uh, the presentation later, and we encourage you to uh, take a look and, and give us some feedback. Um, how does this link to biodiversity? Well, so if we look at this, uh, this is one study that looked at charcoal production and other sources of wood exploitation uh, outside of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And it shows you have a correlation between distance from town and exploitation where charcoal itself drops off going out of town, uh, other timber extraction increases, and you find the, the spatial correlation also fits with forest condition, looking at changes in basal area and standing biomass, and also with species richness. So species richness is most heavily impacted closer to the city where the charcoal uh, uh, extraction is most intense and falls off as you get further away as charcoal production is, uh, is less intense. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about impacts. Um, it, the next natural question might be, well, can we can we mitigate these impacts? If, if wood fuel uh, demand is causing them, if we ratchet wood fuel demand down, can we, uh, can we expect a, a rebound? Can we expect recovery? And there's very little research in this area, but this is perhaps like the most important uh, question to, to ask, right? So I'm aware of just two studies that have looked at this and I'll, I'll talk about one. Um, so this study was done in South India in the state of Karnataka, looking at a large scale intervention of biogas. Um, I won't go into the technical details of that. If anyone's interested, we can uh, we can discuss during the Q and A. Um, so this is a very large intervention. It covered 800, over 800, nearly 900 communities, um, and uh, where biogas digesters were disseminated with the idea that they would displace uh, fuel wood consumption. Um, ten years later, okay, ten years. It's a long time to wait to do a research study, um, but it's necessary in this kind of situation. Um, researchers set up a natural experiment. They looked at communities that had a successful intervention and compared it to communities that did not using statistical matching techniques, and they found that communities with successful biogas interventions, keyword here is successful, that means people actually uptook it and they continued to work uh, for that entire 10 year period, uh, were significantly associated with higher fire forest biomass, uh, higher abundance and diversity of different kinds of saplings, and uh, their terms, better prospects for long-term generation because of those conditions, okay? So important takeaway here, this study was done 10 years after the intervention. So if you think about how we would set up research to do this kind of thing, to look at whether an intervention was effective or not, um, that's a key parameter to, to understand that these things take time to play out. And also, not all of the outcomes were statistically significant. 
only some of them. So uh, that's something also to consider. Uh, in addition, one thing I want to point out, there's a lot of variance here. Um, and the only way they found statistically significant differences was to have a very large end. So it was a very ambitious kind of study. Um, and th but this is the kind of thing that, that's required to really understand whether the interventions are having impact on outcomes that you're uh, interested in. Okay, just want to wrap up by uh, discussing some of the uh, policies that we might consider uh, in order to encourage inter um, uh, action in this space um, that we might think to uh, to implement in order to achieve desired outcomes, say, you know, lessening impact on biodiversity. Um, so if you think about wood fuels, wood energy, and, and how we might uh, encourage transitions in this space, you, know, you might start with high level policy tools like uh, nationally determined contributions. So these are, these are statements that every country makes to the UNFCCC uh, to determine what they, you know, to their commitments to, to action. Um, and 98 nations highlighted here in this map have some sort of target uh, looking at wood fuels. Here, the primary objective, of course, is climate change mitigation, okay? But we might expect, if these are successful, that we would also see positive impacts on biodiversity. Um, other high-level policy tools um, might be looking at the SDGs and impl implementing actions to achieve SDG 7, which is universal, universal access to clean energy for all. Um, others might be at a national level, national energy plans or, or, uh, or national development plans or energy policies. Um, one thing I want to point out, though, while this is very much in the in the you know, has, has made its way into the discourse for um, global action on climate change. It's not at all in discourse around uh, conventions and biodiversity. So I found 98 countries uh, have targets in their NDCs, very few. I found five examples where nations have included some sort of target related to wood fuels in the convention for biological diversity. So it's not at all in that space. And that's something that if we wanted to take action in this way, would be maybe the first target to uh, to look at. Um, I'll stop there. I realize I've gone on a little bit longer than I should have. And I uh, just want to thank uh, some of the, the folks that I've uh, collaborated with on the model that I showed towards the middle of the presentation, and also to thank the funders, because you should always thank your funders. So I'll stop here and uh, would welcome any questions when the question time comes. So thank you very much, Rob, and, and thanks for sort of walking us through where both research but also knowledge gaps start to speak to challenges we have in policy in this particular arena. And also thanks to the participants. Do keep putting your questions in the chat. Uh, I'm keeping track of those. And when we finish up the presentation, we're going to open it up and uh, start to answer some of those questions. Uh, for now, uh, I'd like to go next to my colleague, Doug Chalmers. Doug is on our water team. And Doug, I'm going to let you start sharing slides and talk about fisheries, water quality, water, water amounts. Great. My screen uh, showing up? Yeah, yes, it is. Awesome. So thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm Doug Chalmers uh, here with SEIUS in Seattle. And I'm here to talk about balancing water supply for biodiversity and human use under climate pressure. And we'll be focusing on this talk um, specifically on a case study in California. The underlying issue that uh, we're thinking about here is water scarcity, where with all these uh, human uses of water with a gl growing global population, um, there's not enough water to go around in many arid and semi-arid areas uh, for all the demands that we place on water. And as part of this, uh, humans have really dramatically impacted our global freshwater systems. We've changed the amount of quantity, the amount of water available in our streams and our lakes. So this shows the global population growing in the gray. And then in red, you kind of see moving alongside it, the global uh, water diversions. So water taken out uh, primarily for agriculture to feed this growing population. On top of quantity, uh, humans have really dramatically impacted the timing and the location of where fresh water exists on our planet. So this shows a map uh, where 63% of major rivers around the world um, are dammed. So you can see in the red that these are areas where we're storing water in places that it didn't naturally exist 
and we're releasing it at different times. So our rivers are behaving differently than they did naturally. As a result of this, um, we see that there are problems uh, to our aquatic species. So this shows in the green our uh, numbers plummeting for abundance of global migratory freshwater fish. So that includes uh, fish that travel up and down our rivers uh, like salmon, most prominently in the US that are impacted by uh, blockage from dams. And coming from this water scarcity also is uh, underlying pressure for a lot of conflict within humans as well. So these are some of the issues that um, SEI has been working to help address. And the goal here, what we're trying to achieve is to balance these different competing uses of water. So having water in our streams uh, for aquatic habitat to protect our aquatic species, but also still maintaining water for our cities and agriculture to feed our population. And what we're trying to do is ask, how can water management optimize both aquatic habitat and human water use? And if we visualize the trade-off between ecosystems and human uses, we're kind of trying to get at the space around here where we get the full benefit of neither of these, but we get most of the benefit of both. So kind of a best of both worlds approach um, or a middle ground approach. And I would say so far, um, I think there's a bit of a consensus that we're sort of in this, at least in California, we're kind of in the space around here where even during uh, the past 10 years of kind of unprecedented droughts in California, you know, agriculture has come out okay. And it's really been the ecosystems and the fish species that have seen just really dramatic uh, pressures and decline. Um, I think in California, generally salmon population abundance is maybe in the single digit percentages of what it was before European development. So how can we kind of get from the space around here to here, you know, trying to, we want as much benefit from the agriculture as we can to feed a global population with healthy fruits and vegetables and keep livelihoods um, in all of our communities. But we need to balance that again with um, providing more habitat for our struggling and threatened species. And tackling these difficult questions is something that SEI is really working on. And what I'll be talking about is an example that we did with a water utility called Valley Water, where we worked to look at reservoir reoperations. Valley Water is a public water utility located around San Jose, California. And the project we had was to help their six dams operate in a way where it better protects the habitat for um, Chinook salmon and steelhead trout, uh, which are struggling local species. At the start of the project, uh, the reservoir releases when they release their water and how much is shown here in a basic sample. The release in the winter is pretty low and the release in the summer when there's human demands for water is highest. And in fact, this is actually completely backwards of the natural uh, river pattern in California. So California being a Mediterranean climate naturally actually has a wet winter and a dry summer. So the native fish species that have adapted to this uh, river flow over you know, thousands and thousands of years uh, this is this does not provide the habitat that they're used to and it's not compatible with their life cycles of traveling from the ocean 
you know, up these cold streams into the hills and mountains and then back downstream to the ocean. And in fact, by keeping this unnatural pattern, we're actually inviting um, invasive species to habitat. So this was kind of the status quo that we were looking to help. And to do that, to kind of uh, help provide analysis in this problem to help solve it, we developed the, what's called the Aquatic Habitat Assessment Tool, which is used to really quantify the quality and the amount of aquatic habitat. And just to give um, a brief overview of it, we simulate uh, the water utility operations of these reservoirs using the mo water modeling platform SVI has developed with 50,000 users around the world called WEEP. Using WEEP, um, we simulate different patterns of the reservoir operations, which gives us the stream flow. If we look at hydraulic relationships, we can relate stream flow to then quantify depth, velocity, and temperature, given the different geometry of our river channels. We then look to what biologists consider what the salmon species can tolerate in terms of depth, velocity, and temperature, and then what conditions they actually are, thrive in most. And then by relating um, that we can actually finally connect the curve between uh, different reservoir operations and then the quantity and quality of the habitat suitability and fish passage. And we use that to really work with a group of local stakeholders, um, water utility experts, and fish biologists to compare different reservoir operations and think, well, what if we did this? And then we saw, oh, you know, we're still not seeing um, that result we're looking for. And in kind of this iterative process and having this tool that can really show us how we're doing and quantify these different uh, operations and compare them, we were able to actually come up with a proposed set of reservoir reoperations that is now being piloted by the utility. So instead of these original operations, uh, the reoperations basically better match natural flow patterns. So we have higher flows in the winter, which is how California um, naturally is and what the fish need to perform a lot of their reproductive life cycles when they travel up and downstream um, from the ocean in the winter. And we have pulse flows, which sort of reset the sediment to create habitat and they stimulate the fish to travel upstream and downstream. And these pulse flows kind of mimic the natural um, high peaks and flow from winter storms. Of course, um, there is limited water supply and to release more water in the winter does make it harder to release as much water in the summer. I mean, that being said, in California, the summer is the natural dry season. And to try to keep the streams wet and cold over the summer for the steelhead that live there um, year round, we found uh, that cold water management was able to keep the habitat still pretty healthy. So by closely tracking and being uh, careful about how we release the amount of cold water stored at the bottom of the reservoir, we were able to keep pretty decent um, habitat in the summer, even while releasing more water in the winter. So how did we do? With these reservoir operations, did we achieve our goal to kind of strike that balance of getting the best of both worlds between ecosystems and human uses? The results show that for spawning, incubation, and rearing, which is when the fish travel upstream, lay their eggs, and the eggs hatch, and then the new fish grow, um, we saw increased uh, better habitat by about 15%. And in terms of the number of years where the fish have opportunities and sufficient flow to get past any blockages in the stream, we we're able to provide better reliability um, for traveling up and downstream at about 15% as well. Of 
course, like I said, you know, um, water is, there's a finite supply of it. And to give water to one thing, in many cases, takes it away from another. So you, unfortunately, water is a space where instead of more win-win, we kind of are thinking more about balance. So this did come at an expense of about 1.2% to water supply delivery. So the trade-offs here, it, you know, it really reflects a lot of the challenges of working with water. Um, in a way, kind of marginal trade-offs, you know, about 15% better habitat and at a price of 1% to our water supply. That being said, um, I think that the increase to the habitat is maybe a bit more than just these aggregate numbers led on because the biologists, they kind of identified this reliability of fish passage and uh, specifically a lot of the critical life stage times in the winter when the habitat is, is actually better than this aggregate. Um, so we did target a bit more of really the critical pieces that the fish need to survive. So I, I do like to think that perhaps while more mar marginal than um, you'd like to think, that it still does represent an opportunity where only a little bit of we're taking away from the human water supply for a pretty good benefit to our fish. So I would argue that this was kind of a best of both worlds approach where we were able to achieve that. And to learn more, uh, we were published uh, in a journal article in uh, PLOS Water. And that's it for now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, what I really appreciate in that presentation is it speaks to sort of one of the ways in which we do navigate some of these trade-offs um, in terms of informing policy, just by trying to provide evidence and showing people kind of clearly what those trade-offs are. And, you know, at a very low cost for water for human use, you get these significant habitat increases. It at least gives you an evidence basis to make, a, discuss, make comments or inputs into policy processes that might lead to changes in practice. Um, shifting now to my water program lead, Laura Forney, uh, she's going to talk to us a little bit about the combination of nature-based solutions, dealing with source water areas, and even the challenge of finance that goes along with all of that. So we're getting a little bigger and maybe a little more complex, if that's at all possible, in this conversation. <laughs> Laura, over to you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, that was a great presentation, uh, Doug. And I think I'm going to go broader into watershed. I'm going to share um, the work that my colleagues and I did in the context of source water protection, uh, nature-based actions and solutions to safeguard ecosystems and natural areas that contribute to water uh, availability. And I'm going to share about the case of Quito and then open up also to uh, more global analysis that we did uh, with USAID funding. Um, so first, uh, so sort of framework, a general frame, uh, water influences everything we do as humans <laughs> and climate change influences uh, almost everything about water. Um, so this uh, presentation is going to touch upon the impacts of climate change and how it's intensifying um, the water cycle leading to heavier, um, more destructive storms and rainfall and how water managers in different contexts are trying to find solutions to uh, these extreme events and, and the ripple effects that it could have to uh, various contexts and how biodiversity could help as one of the um, potential actions from water managers. Particularly the, the ripple effects are very complex, nonlinear, and with different characteristics depending on which watershed we're talking about. And I'm going to connect to uh, Quito uh, project. This is a project that was funded by the Inter-American Development Bank in collaboration with MAPS, which is the water utility for the Metropolitan District of Quito, and FONAG, which is the organization that manages water funds. And this project um, was mainly in support of the, um, the development of a water plan for the next uh, 20 to 50 years. And this was um, 
done following what we uh, lead in terms of the robust decision support process and framework, uh, where we analyze the vulnerabilities and, and contribute to the resilience of the, of the water system. Um, this framework is a combination of uh, participatory components, analytical tools. Again, uh, we use the WEEP, the water evaluation and planning that Doug was mentioning, and as well as different visualization platforms and um, the contribution to policy processes and, and implementation. Uh, in this analysis in the Quito project, we included climate change projections. Uh, we also included analysis in terms of uh, catastrophic events like earthquake that could destroy uh, pipelines and, and failures to the systems. Uh, we included ecological flow requirements so that usually those are kind of the first step in preserving the aquatic ecosystem. Uh, what Doug presented is kind of going in depth of quantifying that habitat. And then we also looked into um, some of the uncertainties in terms of the expanding number of users, uh, the system vulnerabilities and, and various scenarios in combination with climate change. Um, so this project contributed to the system master plan uh, and it was in, done in 2021. And following up to that project, um, a little bit more details. This, um, as you can see on the left-hand side, there's a map of the system, um, we represented the natural areas and you can see the shades of green are the, the forest, the paramo land and, and various vegetations in the system. And looking at the climate change impacts on water, but also representing these natural areas in the WIP model, the daily time scale to really quantify something that is often not easy or not done um, because it requires data and, and sophisticated analysis is quantifying the benefits of the natural areas and the protections of these areas to um, the water system. And this is something that's been done for years um, in, in, in this context of, of Iquito and Ecuador, and this is done by FONAC. And I'll go into more details about water funds um, and, and the implementation challenges that comes to that. And being, I think it's an example of, of great success um, in valuing the, the, the contributions of natural areas. And this is where I'm moving to another project uh, funded by USAID, where we looked at the financing implication for source water protection and the connection with watershed level management, particularly how large cities and, and Quito is a great example of that and uh, working with the map, how cities can be enabler, enablers and, and how can help uh, finance the uh, implementation of these conservation actions and nature-based solutions. So we look into the literature, but also we looked into seven uh, case studies, successful case studies. And again, nature-based solutions, um, or you know, people are not familiar with um, with that. The conservation of wetlands, of natural areas like forest, um, and restoration also of those natural areas. There's also some actions that are green agricultural practices, green stormwater management, and and other um, actions that I didn't include here. But those are kind of the the main components of, of source water protection. Um, and again, going back to Fonag. This is the water fund from um, Quito that I want to highlight. It was created in 2000 and it's, it's a very um, great example, a successful example of how different contributions can help protect ecosystem and the co-benefits that that brings. You know, it's not only just for more water availability in key um, parts of, of the year, but also in terms of biodiversity and the many benefits that that brings. Uh, they've done a very innovative financing and management of, of the resources. FONAG is a strong leader um, promoting this successful implementation. And also this was in the project that previously we did, we connected these contributions of the natural areas with also the implementation of stream flow requirements for aquatic ecosystems as well. So this is a great 
combination of actions for water availability that also have a great contributions to biodiversity. And another thing that I wanted to mention that Ecuador as a country had also included the rights of nature in the constitution in, in 2021. Um, so another um, kind of a slide that I want to share is bringing it up in terms of not only the Quito projects and example, but opening up the, the analysis in the financing implications that help FONAG, and, and, and it was an access test for FONAG, and how it can help other contexts, and these actions can be implemented um, in, in other parts of the world for, for these co-benefits that I mentioned. So it does require long-term and sustained efforts. Um, the impacts are not seen immediately. The results are not being, they're not seen right away. But the benefits are great, and and even though they're difficult to quantify, I think we now with new technologies and machine learning and remote sensing, it can be done, and and we've done it in in Weep, and and I think this is something that we can continue promoting and 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 helping implement in terms of um, also the coordination with different stakeholders and 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 institutions and actors. And the outreach that is needed, um, so this is something that FONAC has done a great job in terms of coordinating with land users um, to, to start looking at the primary benefits here of so water uh, quantity and quality and improvements that, um, that are brought by the conservation of the natural areas. And also the importance of monitoring to showing these benefits and the impacts that those benefits are having in, in the watershed and trying to reduce also the, the transaction costs that sometimes um, are present in other contexts um, for the inequitable access to, to those um, payments. I'll bring uh, kind of another general slide on what we found from this research uh, on, and I put the link in the bottom. There's a, a large report that talks about source water protection and, and successful stories and the factors that are enablers for cities, right, to be cities being at the, the key promoters of, of these actions. Um, it does require strong leadership and political commitment. Um, we've seen the strong leadership from FONAC, but also from MAPS and, and the tariffs that um, that they were able to bring and manage for, for getting the, the water funds implemented. Uh, the efficient water system management, being able to manage the system and quantify the trade-offs and benefits. Um, plenty of different financing options, not only from the water utility in the city, but also from the industry. Uh, that's a key component of the case of Quito. Uh, and in other contexts, um, the, in the context like, for example, in Africa or in other places, there's big funders that can be enablers initially, but then how other aspects need to be brought into uh, that implementation. For example, the long-term commitments, the leadership, having a trade-off analysis, having a responsible transparent fund administration um, initially and then for the continuation and effective regulatory structures that can uh, facilitate that, that continuation. Some of the inhibitors uh, that we found in, in, in the different uh, cases that we examine and also from the broad literature, um, the low user fees, if there are not enough fees or contributions, it's hard to maintain the conservation and the protection of source water um, um, protection of areas. Also the prioritization, if there are low prioritization of source water protection, that can be a challenge in terms of making sure that they're effective. And again, this has to be a continual support in order to work. Um, limited national or international investment in water. And I think here, capitalizing and seeing the co-benefits that it's not just water um, allocation or the benefits in regulating and, and contributing to, to water availability. It's also the conservation of these areas for the biodiversity, the fauna and the flora, and many other uh, co-benefits in terms of the communities that live in this area and connecting with also with indigenous communities that are located in some parts of these um, natural areas in, in Latin America. 
And another inhibitor is the low investment um, in improving efficiencies, right? So there's the system, there are many aspects of water management and, and the systems and in some contexts not being able to um, safeguard the losses, like the, the losses of water in the system and in the distribution can also be uh, an inhibitor in quantifying the benefits of uh, of the nature-based solutions and those actions that are implemented to safeguard um, water, sort of water areas. Uh, lack of trust, so good leadership and trust in that leadership is, is important. And the participation of the different stakeholders and buy-in is also a key aspect that uh, if that's lacking, it's, it's gonna be uh, difficult to, to implement. And, um, and some of the key takeaways from um, from this research for finance source water protection and biodiversity conservation, uh, like I said, the strategies for financing source water protection need to include multiple financing sources. Um, in the case of Kipo, it was Conag working with MAPS, but also there's a beverage industry that contributed a lot of the funding, also the electrical uh, companies. Uh, provided some funding. So that's a way um, of diversifying the contributions uh, from uh, from different actors in, in the watershed. The um, watershed protection requires also, and I mentioned before, this long-term sustained efforts. So this is very important and that is something that um, it needs to be considered. And I think that's important of the, the leadership that really it yields immediate results. So it has to be a commitment to for long-term financing mechanism that, that can support that in the long term. And key factors that contribute to establishing and implementing successful financing for social water protection, like I mentioned, the strong leadership, the political commitment. So if there's political instability in a country, it's challenging to make sure that these, um, these actions of source water protection work. Uh, stakeholder involvement is key. As if we talk about watershed scale, having the different actors in the watershed involved is, is it facilitates implementation and the complement over time. Trust is a key component. Trust in the leadership and the buy-in from the stakeholders, and again, this long-term uh, commitment to uh, to ensure that that this is is sustained um, in in the future and. We see uh, that this is something, it's this nature-based solution is coming up more and more as moving from gray to more green infrastructure. And I think quantifying not only the benefits in terms of water, but also in biodiversity, uh, it, it can really help promoting more of these, these um, necessary actions to um, adapt under the different challenges that are, are brought by climate change. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to respond to any any questions. Thank you, Laura. And uh, you know, I was just at Climate Week in person for the last several days, and of course, financing is one of these giant issues. And and one thing that I hear coming up that you've started to touch on is, you know, how do you drive climate finance? How do we get more of it? But now, starting to talk about the co-benefits of climate finance for things like biodiversity or water protection, and how do we think about pulling all of this together. Um, and I think that this then, you know, the last three talks, and I'll start in a second, um, speak to SEI's role as a research organization. We, in, we seek to inform policy and inform decision-making. We are not, of course, ourselves an implementer or decision-maker of our own. Um, and so if we've been moving sort of, I'll say from the ground slowly, slowly upward, let me get to a pretty high level with mine, which is to talk a little bit about something that's come up in my role, both as a lead author for the IPCC and now a coordinating lead author for the IFS Transformative Change Assessment. And that is the fact that our global assessment processes actually stovepipe climate change and biodiversity, um, what the implications of that might be and uh, how we might address those things. So let me get my slides up and going here and we'll go. Sorry, minor technical challenge from my side, but I will get it. Let's see if I can, there we go. 
And of course, it started at the wrong end of the presentation. <laughs> Some days, this is what happens to you. There we go. All right, so it is no surprise to anybody, of course, and if you've been listening to the last couple of talks, it won't be a surprise either, um, that climate and biodiversity action are deeply interlinked, right? Temperature and precipitation are key inputs to ecosystems, and ecosystems act as carbon sinks, and that's just two ways in which these interlinkages exist. You've also heard several others outlined today. Um, but climate and biodiversity are really just two slices, two ways of approaching a really complex Earth system. Uh, an Earth system, incidentally, that human beings have become one of the principal drivers of change, and if not the principal driver of change. At the global assessment level, though, we tend to treat these as different entities with very limited integration uh, and, frankly, some limited measurement and learning across domains. We have, for example, the IPCC process, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's an absolutely critical state of knowledge exercise that's undertaken in seven-year cycles. And a lot of people don't understand the basic purpose of the IPCC. Its main role is to provide the agreed facts for climate negotiations. This is why IPCC summaries for policymakers are politically negotiated, because in the end, all the parties to the UNFCCC have to agree on this document because it will be put in place for that purpose. As with most assessments then, the IPCC is narrowly focused on the convention it serves, which is the UNFCCC. So to give you an example, even when we're not talking about the main assessment report of the IPCC, we can look at some of the special reports, like the special report on climate change and land, which came out in 2019. This is very clearly a report that touches on climate change and an aspect of, and something that greatly impacts biodiversity, which is climate's impact on land. And what you got were, to a degree, climate's contributions to land degradation and land degradation's contributions to the climate. But as you can see in this chart here, one of the figures from the summary for policymakers, when they start talking about response options, it all goes one way. Anything that you're doing on land, whether that is for biodiversity, against biodiversity, is measured only in terms of what kinds of things it's doing, either to mitigation and adaptation or to other land uh, issues. Very, very narrowly focused. It did not step out wider to look at the broader implications. Similarly, IPBES's global assessments uh, also take a fairly narrow approach to thinking about biodiversity as the main entry point. Uh, IPBES is an independent governmental body. It's the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, it was established by states to improve the science policy interface to promote sustainable use of biodiversity. Note sustainable use of biodiversity as the framing there. It is not a UN body, unlike the uh, IPCC, that can create some conversation challenges right there. But it's another assessment aimed at supporting a specific multilateral agreement, in this case, the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. It helps with implementation. It's supposed to inform the findings of the IPBES are supposed to inform implementation, supposed to help inform assessment of progress toward the goals in that framework, and are supposed to provide the scientific and technical basis uh, for follow-up in future agreements or future versions of that agreement. In these assessments, you will find references to climate change principally as a source, uh, as a direct driver of biodiversity loss. And then there are some references to biodiversity as a source of climate regulation, but again, a very narrow frame of where climate change fits in, not some sort of deeply integrated discussion of what's going on. Now, you might say, who cares? So we have IPCC, they're really good at climate. That's good news. We've got IFBES, they're very, very good at biodiversity. That's also great news. So don't worry about it, no problem. Well, there is a problem, which is when we start dividing the world in this way with these kinds of multilateral agreements, which then lead to these kinds of separated assessment processes, we end up with different kinds of programming that respond to those specific agreements and processes. And those multilateral agreements are stovepiping the, the Earth system I described into these slices, which we use for, I would argue, the purposes of research and academic convenience to better understand the world. Those become real things with real money and real practices out there. We also start seeing political agreements with targets that are aimed at those particular slices of the Earth system instead of a more holistic understanding of what's going on and what actions we need to take. This creates huge risks, trade-offs compromising our climate or biodiversity or even both outcomes that are not being captured or thought about when we're both assessing and then framing action in this very stovepiped kind of way. 
And we can end up with deeply unequal outcomes for people in different places if we're not looking across both climate and biodiversity when thinking about what's happening in the world and what actions need to be taken. Now, I'm an optimist by nature, so I tend to look at challenges and look for opportunities. And I see this challenge as an opportunity because I think that there's an opportunity in practice for leveraging change in assessments and thus iteratively starting to change how we practice in the world. I've spent the last four years, I just finished a term on the scientific and technical advisory panel of the Global Environment Facility. So I spent the last four years advising the GEF on its adaptation programming. For those of you not familiar with the GEF, it is the financing mechanism for the multilateral agreements. You see them all listed here. I've only highlighted two for relevance to this topic for our webinar today on uh, biodiversity and climate change and the trade-offs between them. Um, and within the GEF, biodiversity and climate change are taken up in different ways. Biodiversity and climate change mitigation programming is taken up through the main trust fund. That's the largest amount of money the GEF has. Biodiversity is also taken up through the very new Global Biodiversity Framework Fund, a separate trust fund created to work on biodiversity issues that just came into existence a little over a year ago. And then climate change adaptation lives in a separate trust fund, the what's called the Least Developed Countries Fund and the Special Climate Change Fund. These pots of money do not work well together. They often have their own strategies. They have their own replenishment processes. They have their own targets. And as a result, we end up with unacknowledged contradictions and trade-offs within the GEF. However, again, there are opportunities in this because the GEF is the only multilateral organization that actually is responsible to multi multiple multilateral agreements and actually uh, takes action across all of them. So you can use the GEF potentially to leverage change in these multilateral agreements. Some work that I've been doing that started in just my adaptation advising to the GEF was to look at what adaptation benefits are being delivered initially by adaptation actions, figuring out a framework to understand what good came of adaptation actions. This framework is very simple. It simply says that an adaptation action should be something that either reduces your exposure to a hazard, lowers your sensitivity to it, or increases your adaptive capacity to deal with that hazard or to take advantage of new opportunities that emerge. Well, it turns out you can use that tool to look outside of the adaptation portfolio. And so a colleague of mine on the scientific and technical advisory panel and I turned that tool and pointed it to the main trust fund and started to look at the biodiversity funding in that trust fund and several other kinds of funding to look at what kinds of adaptation benefits might be emerging from purely biodiversity activities that were never conceived of having an adaptation benefit. And we wanted to do this for two reasons. The first was to demonstrate back to the Jeff the deeply intellect character of adaptation and biodiversity work, that these are not in fact separate worlds, and to uh, illustrate back to the Jeff that they have a problem, that there are unacknowledged actions happening across their portfolio, and we're not learning from them, we don't know what their outcomes are because we're not even paying attention to them. All my colleague and I did was take a look at the first half of what's called Jeff 8, the current four-year cycle of programming. It, we're only about halfway through Jeff 8. And we found up to this point, only five biodiversity or biodiversity plus one other area projects. And what we did is we looked at these projects to figure out what kinds of adaptation actions were being taken in an unacknowledged sort of way. Without going deep into our methodology, what I can show you is the result of that which is our estimate, and we have to estimate because we're looking at project design documents right now and the budgets are a little bit general, so we have a high and a low estimate here. You can see that in just the first half of Jeff 8, in just the biodiversity program, this is just five projects, the Jeff is directly spending somewhere between five and a half and nearly $10 million of its own money on actions that are delivering some kind of an adaptation benefit. Further, it's leveraging money, because that's what the Jeff does. It leverages other projects to deliver benefits that otherwise wouldn't be delivered. It is leveraging somewhere between 35 and $55 million in actions that, again, are delivering some kind of adaptation benefit. This is only across five projects, only in the first half of one Jeff cycle. Clearly, there's quite a bit of activity going on inside the biodiversity portfolio that probably is benefiting adaptation out there. 
We haven't looked, by the way, back at, because uh, we weren't, I was an adaptation advisor, so I wasn't looking to see what biodiversity benefits are being delivered, although it's almost certain that there's adaptation actions that are delivering biodiversity benefits as well. What does this mean then in terms of leveraging change? Well, first, you want to work on change within the JEF, again, home to all, these finance, all this financing for the multilateral agreements. The JEF 9 cycle is under design right now. And one of the questions that the JEF always asks itself is, does our current structure maximize our impact, help us deliver the global environmental benefits we're supposed to be delivering? And I think the answer that we're starting to demonstrate just by looking at adaptation and biodiversity is no, probably not. What you're doing right now is delivering a lot of stuff that you're not accounting for, that you're not measuring, you're not learning from, and therefore we don't know what the outcomes are. So it's probably not maximizing impact and it could be setting up bad trade-offs that no one's aware of. What's our pathway to some kind of change? Well, within the GEF, the pathway is to start feeding these results first back to the scientific and technical advisory panel, which has a formal advisory role to the GEF and therefore can provide this in as advice to the GEF 9 process. However, to be honest, policy processes are also driven by relationships. And so some of this is also information that we will deliver to Jeff staff directly as they think about projects and programming going forward. And we can also use this to inform the Jeff Council, which are the political representatives from the governments that sit on the Jeff Council and see how they respond to the notion of these kinds of benefits being delivered or identified in an unacknowledged, or being delivered in an unacknowledged way without being identified and see if that triggers any kind of change. The point being is that if the Jeff were to start to reorganize itself away from some of these stove pipes, it would create changes in practice there that have a chance to feed back up to multilateral environmental agreements. Because again, the Jeff is the vehicle through which the MEAs actually implement money. So there's a small chance that we could use this as a tiny little lever that starts to work on changing the character and content of the assessments that are conducted in the name of these multilateral environmental agreements uh, and better inform their work. And thus, hopefully, create a sort of virtuous cycle of change between sort of assessment, then the actions assumed to be needed because of that assessment, the character of action that we learn from those, the needed character of action that we learn from implementing some of those actions, which then can feed back into the assessment process and perhaps move us toward more holistic and effective environmental assessments. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna stop talking and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And what I would like to do is look into the chat. And I'm going to start just uh, going through some of the questions that we've gotten, because we have several in there, and uh, ask my colleagues to start responding to them. And for everyone who's still on the webinar, please, of course, you keep adding your questions to the chat. I'm very happy to uh, keep bringing those up as we go. Um, I want to start at a, the high, a high level question that I saw in here and get a read out from all of you. And then I'm going to go to some of the specific ones. Um, I saw early on uh, Austin Sanchez asked uh, if there were any sort of prominent or actionable suggestions uh, about how policy can be designed to balance these competing interests. Um, because everyone here has talked about some degree of a competing interest. Um, Maybe, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to take that one up first or I can just go around the folks on the screen. Doug, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, two clear takeaways that we had from that case study. One was um, include ecosystems in the planning process. So for the whole policy creation process, include it from the start. You know, a lot of times, when it's not basically, we're going to do what we're going to do. And then just kind of at the very end, it's like, oh yeah, ecosystems, how do we check that box? So trying to move away from that and really including ecosystems at the very beginning um, is one thing. The other would be finding ways to quantify um, the ecosystem component, which, you know, I think that there's a lot of ways you could say, well, you know, it's not, it's not, directly comparable to something monetary. I mean, I, I would agree with that, but I think that having the ability to quantify the benefits helps make a policy that benefits ecosystems more defensible. If policymakers can look to the numbers and say, look, we made it 25% better, I think it makes it easier for them on their end. Thanks, Doug. 
Uh, Laura, there was a question along these lines, but it also was aimed at you, which was asking, this was from Sandra Ryan, about um, the enablers and inhibitors that you had up and the extent to which those things are offsetting or how they can be addressed. I wondered if you wanted to take that up. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, depends on the context. But I, you know, generally speaking, I think the that's why the emphasis on the strong leadership and political commitment by, for example, making some national national agenda uh, or finding ways to to increase funding, so that could counteract one of the inhibitors of low prioritization. I think that that is is one of the the ways. Um, also, a key aspect of the inhibitors is you know the low user fees. So what I show about FONAC having like a blending of different funding, uh, financing options, I think it could be a good way to counteract that inhibitor. Um, the stakeholder engagement is key um, and transparency, which can build trust and, and, and the participation that is one of the, the inhibitors that I, that I mentioned. Um, and this long-term commitment, um, I think demonstrating that commitment long term from this political uh, leadership can be also a way to to counteract or and going back to Doug's comment on quantifying like trade offs and including some some data on the benefits or the co benefits I think is is important. Um, however, I think that <laughs> there's a still the, depending on the context, it could be difficult to implement and there's strong inhibitors and. And I think I go back to that political will uh, at the national level and, and the institutions that are within those countries, uh, insufficient funding or investment or lack of trust in, in those governments can definitely be an inhibitor. And, and it can really um, kind of promote sometimes the investment in great um, in infrastructure instead of green. Um, so yeah, I think that's you know depending on the context, I don't want to get too specific, but yeah, that's a great question because it's one of the main challenges I think we see around the world. And there's another question about um, the sites reservoir, uh, and I think with Doug maybe we can respond to that later on. But uh, yeah, that was interesting too. Yeah, I'm, I want to take that one out. But before we go to that, I wanted to ask Rob about this broader sort of uh, the the balancing sort of the different interests when we get into policy? Yeah, I, I mean, I would answer that in a way, I guess it, it depends on what the source of the competition is. You know, if it's grounded in a power struggle, then that's one, mm -hmm. one set of approaches that you might take. If it's grounded in, you know, an, an ideological position, um, then that would be maybe another set. And I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the second, uh, maybe explain what I mean by that. So in my little space, uh, you know, there's uh, much of the, the action in in uh, household energy and clean cooking it isn't centered around biodiversity. As I said, look, that's that's a very understudied and, and not well understood uh, aspect of it. Um, but another is is centered on health and the health impacts that I that I alluded to earlier, um, and that's really generated uh, much of the current action. Um, and one way to make the pathway less health risky is just to switch people away from burning solid fuels entirely. And the, and the, the easiest uh, route there is burning uh, LPG, burning fossil fuel. Uh, it burns very cleanly. Uh, there, are, there are outlets all over the world. You know, you have uh, service stations, petrol stations everywhere that are distributing it. Um, but it's a fossil fuel, right? So there are there's an ideological opposition to that for many donor countries. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's one flavor of competing interest. One way you can address that is just to look at the numbers, you know, like they're ideologically opposed to that because it's a fossil fuel, but some work that, uh, that I and others have done have shown that it's actually a climate win. If you shift people away from poorly managed and very poorly combusted small scale biomass over to, uh, to cooking gas, despite it being a fossil fuel. So that sort of ideological position crumbles if you, you know, if you'd actually do some some solid analysis, maybe that'll work in other cases as well. But you know, maybe it's just this this particular question. If things are more grounded in a power struggle, like a political economy kind of question, then then that's a different kind of issue. Uh, it's not one that necessarily better data is going to help you work through. 
And this is what I'm hearing across all these. And thanks, Rob, because that starts to really pull this together is, you know, SEI, we are a science organization. We're a research organization. Um, our job is to get that evidence that can inform decision making. So what you're hearing each person here talk about is we're all looking for a leverage point where our information is useful, can inform a decision, can drive some kind of a change. Sometimes our information is great for that. Sometimes, as Rob pointed out, it's not about better data, and mm -hmm. that's not going to be the argument. And to some extent, uh, in my case, the stuff I'm thinking about right now, it, it sort of encounters some of that. Um, you know, how much money the Jeff spends on uh, delivering an adaptation benefit it doesn't know about. Mm -hmm. To some extent, it's not that huge an amount of money against me. That's not really the issue. The issue is to get the member governments who are anxious about the use of very limited public funds to pay attention to the fact that this isn't going as well as they think it might be. And the question is, which of those governments will care enough to go on to the council and say, wait a second, this is not the way we thought things were going to go. And will they be able to mobilize those kinds of changes? But that's not something I can do. I can provide evidence that hopefully mobilizes some of those folks and I can work with them to get more evidence if that's what they need. But again, that's what you're hearing from all of us here when we think about policy change or any kind of change in the world is, you know, where can what we know and what we know how to do play into that process and ideally drive some of that? And I think we're all pretty good at thinking about where those leverage points might be. Um, Laura, you were really, you want to take up uh, that yeah. reservoir question. So I'm, I'm going to let you go with it. Yeah, thank you. I love the question, Shannon, I think it um, asked it. I mean, in California, yes. right, there's all this conversation about the sites reservoir. Um, and yeah, we always think of nature-based solutions. I mean, there are financing models that focus on projects and in East Incorporate, this is the ecosystem-based approach. Um, so I don't know much about the sites reservoir kind of, it's multi-objective, I'm sure, but in, you know, that component I think is, is important. Um, and these nature-based solutions approaches, the idea is that, yeah, they help manage water, reduce risk, um, enhance biodiversity. So I think if there is some good argument, a good case for for that, um, you know, it, maybe it's worth exploring. Um, it, it has to be, you know, a financing model with this leverage of public and private funds, you know, like I mentioned, uh, I think those partnerships are important. So I'm not sure, you know, in terms of the bonds and and the financing mechanisms in California when it comes to to this infrastructure developments, right? So um, there's, I, I think I will need to do some more research <laughs> to answer fully, but I, I I can see how, you know, this is worth exploring if that connection with the ecosystem is. Is the structure within that? I don't know, Doug, if you want to comment on that question. Yeah, uh, it, it types out an answer. Um, so I know that we have applied WEEP with DWR's water plan updates, and I'm not sure if the, the reservoir would be part of those. Um, I know that we haven't applied the aquatic habitat assessment where we, we quantify the, the fisheries impacts, but I mean, certainly, you know, with the right cross-channel data and the biological data, I mean, that that does sound like the the perfect application for it. So happy to discuss more. You know, it could be a good opportunity. Doug, I wanted to stay with you for just one of these questions because I think it's closely related to not just your presentation, but actually how you were just speaking about policy leverage a second ago. Uh, this came from Sandra Ryan, which I, I think she's quite right in saying in many low-income countries, a flat rate environmental flow is currently as good as it gets. Uh, how can we move the needle toward acceptance of annual profiles? And maybe if you have any ideas, just given your experience in this project. Right, so Sandra, I definitely agree with you. Um, that That is kind of the underlying message of my presentation is don't have these arbitrary minimum flows that just provide this flat, river pattern that doesn't exist naturally. You know, let's let's be smart about it and let's try to provide the flows that naturally occurred and balanced out with human use. So, so you're spot on there. Um, as for how do we get there, I know that we can point to an existing um, 
research collaboration in California where they call it the functional flows approach. Um, and that while developed for California, it can be applied elsewhere. So that's one piece of research where you can say, look, all these credible researchers, you know, think that this is the right thing to do. And perhaps um, just kind of my gut would be, I think what, what convinced me was really putting yourselves in the shoes of the species and kind of describing the mechanisms of here's where it breaks down. You know, the fish, need, they need to travel upstream and downstream. And if you provide these types of flows, these unnatural flows, then the fish, they would not be able to get past this point in the river. And if they can't do that, then they can't reach the points where they reproduce. So I think really describing kind of like the specific mechanism of here's where that would go wrong and here's how the fish operate it. I think that would breed the understanding. And then that starts to, I think, would make the policymakers really think about the flows from the perspective more of the species. Thanks, Doug. Um, hey, why not go full third rail and get into uh, carbon markets, Rob? Uh, there's a great question here. Uh, Diane Russell puts in, uh, the carbon credit market uh, offsetting is here. I, I have it near the top of my, here we go. Um, uh, so carbon credit market offering clean cook stove credits. Uh, I would love to hear your response to this because I know you've uh, you've encountered it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm up to my eyeballs in this. Um, I, I'd say, I mean, I hate to to say to, don't go there because I'm I'm really like I'm I'm steeped in it, and I have you know well, I would I would love to see it work. Um, but yeah, I mean, proceed with caution, like with any any kind of carbon offset. Um, you know, do your do your homework and and really like dig in and and look at what the ratings agencies say. Um, and, and, and they've, they've rated many projects. Um, there, there are problems for sure. Uh, and specifically with stoves. Um, but it, I mean, if you think about it, the, the reasons that there are problems are the reasons it's, it's a, it's a wicked problem generally for, you know, the development community for, for the research community to, to try to solve. And it's been, it's persisted for, for decades now. Um, and well, it's because you're talking about, you know, uh, very poor populations generally uh, don't have access to uh, alternative resources. Um, it's highly dispersed activities, you know, very, very hard to monitor, um, you know, and then, you know, you mix in a few bad faith actors and things go south very quickly. Um, that said, there are some really solid programs out there. And, and in addition to the ratings agencies, uh, there are some other let's say third party uh, as objective as they can be assessments that uh, that help guide what to look for. So you know, overall, it's, it's a sector that really needs investment. You know, it's uh, you know, really a cash starved sector um, compared to, well, other, other investments in energy, other investments in, uh, infrastructure and climate, even in health. I mean, you know, I mentioned that more people die from uh, exposure to wood smoke than malaria, TB, and, and AIDS combined. And if you look at the effort that has gone into addressing those as health problems, um, you know, what the meager investment in, in clean cooking is, is very, very tiny compared to that. So yes, it deserves investment, but um, yeah, they're, 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 they've definitely been overcrediting. Um, so the the one uh, assessment besides the ratings agencies that I mentioned, uh, UC Berkeley did a, a fairly scathing analysis of the sector, uh, a, a couple of researchers that I did quite well. And but what they also did, uh, you know, to their benefit was to put up a, a website. And I don't have the link offhand, but I'm, I'd be happy to to send it to me to you, uh, Sandra, if you want to follow with me personally. Um, telling telling people what to look for essentially, and also advising project developers on on measures they can take. And one final word on this, I'm currently working with a team uh, from, well, the US EPA, the Clean Cooking Alliance slash UN Foundation, um, UNFCCC and Clean, Climate and Clean Air Coalition to develop a new, oh, in Berkeley Air, I got to mention them as well, uh, to develop a new methodology. Uh, so this will take some time to come through, but we've had, pro we've talked to project developers, the guys who are actually doing the, the work on the ground. Uh, to to sort of bring them into the fold and make sure that you know everyone is on board and and if this comes through then hopefully this will avoid some of the the worst outcomes that we've seen uh, reported on. Thanks, Rob. Sure.
Um, I have one that's kind of been percolating for me across this conversation. Um, we are talking, you know, about some of the trade-offs, challenges, how you navigate between climate change and addressing that particular challenge and biodiversity challenges and all of this. And I'm wondering for each of you um, working in different contexts or different domains, um, where we run into issues where different evidence is important to different actors around the same sort of issue or different evidence is seen as valid or an invalid uh, by different actors. In other words, is there, are there issues where uh, research, evidence, scientific evidence um, works for one party, does not work at all for another party, or very specific kinds of evidence will enable one party to act but doesn't do a thing for another party. Uh, I'm wondering if you've run into that at all and if you have how you navigate that. Because I, I do think that that is another one of our challenges is these are sometimes literatures and bodies of practice that run parallel to one another. And they all look at me in terror, which is now <laughs> Doug, Doug throws himself in again. Doug, it's all you. Yeah, no, that, that was very central to the case study that I talked about. Absolutely. That was a humongous challenge. Um, one that I will say we mostly overcome, which was successful. Um, yeah, getting people to agree on the reality, basically, and getting people to agree on the same pieces of data is is huge. Um, so my advice would be don't ignore that. Um, you, you have to address that or you won't be able to get to the solutions. You'll keep talking past each other. Um, and then once you kind of get everyone on the same page, then I think people really do uh, can sympathize with making trade-offs and maybe even making cons personal concessions to kind of benefit uh, the other set of trade-offs. But I think if you have people that just sort of don't agree on this will achieve that or, or th this whole process is bunk because this isn't the reality. So despite that it's challenging, I, th I think that it's important and it will continue to benefit um, the whole situation, um, you know, in the future as well. And I would just say, Doug, that that's actually maybe you just nicely articulated some of my concern with the multilateral environmental assessments. Again, that these are the agreed realities that people are supposed to work from, but they're stovepiping these issues away from each other and perhaps agreeing on different realities in different settings, because in the end, these are sort of political settings um, that approve things like summaries for policymakers. So yes, getting to the agreed reality, I think, is a huge challenge for making any kind of integrated work play out. Um, which then reminds me of a piece of advice I got when I first went to Washington, D.C., um, I had a fellowship that used to bring in a lot of different people who wanted to talk to us. And it was a former Republican congressperson, I won't say from what state, who gave us a really honest and useful talk that more or less ended with, because everybody in the room had a PhD, everybody in the room was a researcher going into government. They said, the problem for you people, I love that phrasing, it was like the problem for you people, we were clearly being othered in this moment, um, is that when you all do your research and get your results, you think you have truth. In this town, you have a viewpoint. And you could see a whole room full of, I was a social scientist, this was not too shocking to me, but like a bunch of natural scientists like nearly keeled over behind me because they were not prepared to hear that empirical reality was a viewpoint. But when you're engaging in policy conversations, sometimes that's where you find yourself. And so, my colleagues at SEI have heard me say this a number of different times. We are not an advocacy organization. We do not go out and advocate for political stances, but we do advocate for our research. We do advocate for our findings. It is not enough to just publish a finding, say, here you go, everybody, and leave. We're going to publish our findings. We're going to do really rigorous work, but then we're going to argue for those findings when people say, try to dismiss them, distort them or something along those kinds of lines. So I think that that's also an important component here, getting to what Doug's talking about in some degree of uh, agreed reality that we all can sort of work from. Uh, mm -hmm. Rob or Laura, I don't know if you have anything you want to respond to that. I mean, I'll say I totally agree <laughs> uh, on our mission to bridging science and policy. Um, 
finding the ways to engage. And and I think with the, at least, you know, the water work that we do with the models, having the data, having ways to communicate effectively and visualize the trade-offs, that is always a great way to, in a participatory setting, to open up the conversation, right? On these trade-offs of the different users. I started saying, you know, uh, we are all as humans, water influences everything we do, but in a different way, right? So you have agriculture, you have um, people working in, you know, hydropower and you have, you know, the cities. And so having that that way of integrating the different perspectives in, in, in the analysis and in the way we get the data, we examine the, um, the impacts with the model, I think is, is key. And, and then one other aspect that I think is, is important is to make sure that the people that are in the table um, are also the ones that were historically or previously excluded, right? Because often um, centralized, particularly, it depends a lot on the context, right? In, and in, in some countries, the decision making around water is very centralized. So how to bring everybody that are affected, you know, in the watershed in 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 a participatory setting is, is challenging. So understanding that context, um, I think is important before we jumped into this is what needs to be included in the model, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is challenging because not always a project of the funding would allow it, right? So it's 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 a challenge that uh, as we're leading the scientific components, uh, we need to we need to navigate, and and it's not always easy. And now, Rob, if you want to come, no, I think you guys covered it really well. I don't have much to add except add that that's a great anecdote. Um, no. It's a real, and the worst part is it's a real one, right? I didn't even have to yeah. create that out of nothing. Um, before we close, I think I'll just, uh, Austin Sanchez just asked uh, a great question. That, and, and Austin, I think the you asked if scientific language can hinder agreements, how do you open up the conversation? I think Laura just started to get at how we open up some of the conversation there. Um, I think you're asking a question that our organization, organizations like us ask all the time in our work. Um, you'll see that SEI researchers, we absolutely publish in the referee literature. We know how to speak to academic communities, but we also know that that literature is not accessible to a lot of the people whose decision making we want to inform, whether that because they literally can't access it because it's behind a paywall or because we just wrote it in language that makes not a bit of sense to an elected official who doesn't need to know all the nuance, doesn't maybe care about your methodology, just needs to know what was the outcome of this? What's the takeaway? What's the big message? Um, so I don't think that there's one answer and we could probably spend a whole session just in trying to answer that particular question. Um, and we're over time, so I'm not gonna force my colleagues to try to do that, except to say that this is something that we take on very, very seriously uh, at SEI. And then several you know, colleagues in other organizations like us also try to take this on. I think it's one of the most interesting challenges we have in front of us is how do we take our research, make it accessible and, and make it actionable. Um, and maybe with that, what I'll do is say that we are at time, and I want to thank my colleagues. Again, thank you to Laura, to Doug, and to Rob. And thank you to everybody for coming out today. It was great to get these questions. I, the best part of these sessions is usually the questions in the conversation, and I think that's uh, been proven today by you all. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to engaging with you, hopefully in other arenas, around other topics soon. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah, thanks for organizing it.